Okay. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. I have our final lecture topic today. Um, but more globally, I have just some general housekeeping items. But before I get into that, I hope everybody had a, um, a relaxing uh, and a wonderful Thanksgiving break. Um, what I'm going to do uh, here in the next little bit is I'm going to go through sort of the, um, the, I guess I would call it the end. And what I mean by that is uh, I want to make sure everybody's crystal clear on what it is they need to do and what's left in order to finish out CE 241. I know that you all have homeworks and lab reports and projects and presentations and a bunch of your other classes. So I thought I would put together sort of a, hey, here it is, everything that's going on in CE 241, okay? Um, first thing I'll mention just right off the bat for you, um, really the only thing that you all have other than a, a very slight bonus assignment is um, homework nine and the exam. But I'll get into the overall details of the grade uh, uh, here in a bit. Um, I did want to mention the at-home game. Uh, I know I said I was going to send that, but I'm going to send that today um, now that there, we've got a little bit more uh, um, to, to put into it. So let me go through remaining housekeeping for the class. Okay. So first off, attendance grades. So your attendance grades on uh, Blackboard are up to date, obviously, other than this week. What I will probably do is wait till we have our lecture today, our lecture Wednesday, and the lab, and then just update them all uh, once this week is over. So probably like by the end of the week, your attendance grade will be done in, in the class. Okay? Let's talk about homework. Okay? Homework assignments. Homeworks 1 through 8 are done. Graded, posted, done. Okay? Homework 9 is uh, due on Wednesday. It is on earthwork areas and volumes. There is one remaining item left on that homework, which is a mass hall diagram, which I'm going to discuss here in a bit. I'm going to upload the solution at 1 p.m. on Friday, but it is still due on Wednesday. Okay, so it'll automatically turn on 1 p.m. on Friday. I'm not accepting anything past that. Okay, sound good? All right, I am going to do one bonus assignment, uh, and that is to do the course eval. Okay. So if you do the course eval, and I want to be clear, I don't want to see like what you said. I, I, that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, you can be as honest or as forthright as, as uh, you want to be. I just want to see that you've done it. Um, I take the feedback very seriously, and uh, it's been a long time since I've taught the class, so if there's any suggestions that you have for future offerings, I would really appreciate it. If you do the course eval and upload the screen capture proof that you did it, I will add 10 bonus points on top of your the earned uh, homework average. What that translates to is about uh, an extra point on your final grade. So if you have an 83 and you did this, you'd probably get about an 84. I say about an 84 because I round the grade at the very end, and so I'll, I'll talk about that here in a bit. But if you have a 76.7, I round that up to a 77. Okay, so that's why I say it's about. Um, Labs, okay, so I know I do still owe you the topo and whatnot, but let's talk about labs. So labs one through nine are done. They're graded, they're posted. Uh, the remaining labs I have left are the topo and the curve lab. The curve lab is gonna be a really easy grade. Um, everybody is pretty much either gonna get a 50 out of 50 on it, or maybe a slight deduction based on the field notes. That's really the only thing I'm checking, because all the math was right, because everybody checked their, their work. Uh, before going out, and the curves were right, because I was there, right? So the only thing I'm checking is the field notes. I can get that done pretty quickly. My goal for the topo is to return the grade to you in lab this week, okay? So that by this week, every lab will be graded other than the lab this week, okay? So let's talk about what's left, okay? So what's left, we have a lecture today on construction. This is our last topic of the semester. We have an exam three review on Wednesday. So just like last, you know, in previous times, you know, come prepared with questions and what have you, that, that's what we're doing during the exam review. The lab this week is gonna be the second plan reading exercise. So what we're gonna do is take those plans, remember the plans we did at the very beginning of the semester, now we're gonna look at them again. But we're gonna ask some more specific questions about those plans now that you're armed with information about what is a horizontal curve? What is a vertical curve, et cetera? So you'll be able to look at those plans a little differently, okay? Um, the exam in here, okay, 
is un unfortunately we drew the short straw, okay? Because we have the last time slot on the last day of finals week, okay? So our final is on Friday, December 8th, and it starts at 12.45. That is, that is not a.m., sorry. That'd be a long test. That'd be a long test, yeah, sorry, hold on. Hold on. All right. There we go. Um, my, my final exam slot, like every professor's final exam slot, it is every professor is given two hours, but I don't design my final in here to be a two-hour exam. I design the final to be a 50-minute exam. But I'm giving you the full two hours, okay? It is very typical during my finals that most people are walking out early because you've got more than enough time to, to complete the exam. As for what's on the exam, the star of the show on the exam is going to be horizontal curves, vertical curves, and earthwork. I may ask a couple of conceptual questions about property surveys or what we talk about today, but it's primarily going to be pretty easy stuff, more intended to be like free throws than, than anything. Really, the stars of the shows are what we've covered the past uh, few weeks. Um, I am going to do a course learning outcome survey during the final as well, but it's just going to be sort of a rank one to five, like how do you think traverses went, how do you think curves went, you know, stuff like that. So basically just asking you the questions on the syllabus. Any questions on remaining housekeeping for the class? Everybody good? One thing, oh, at home game. So I, I think I mentioned this, I don't remember it if I've gone through it in detail, but um, so this is the at home game. It's a spreadsheet that what you'll do is you Input your attendance grade, your homework average, your lab grade, your first two exams. It will compute what your current grade is and then what you need to get on the final to get a certain grade in the class. A buddy of mine in grad school called that playing the at-home game, so that's, that's where that came from. Um, one thing I'll mention is that, so I said I round, right? So if you get, uh, so in order to, so what, so what this cell is saying, the grade required on the exam three to get a B, I'm not back calculating what you need to get an 80. I'm back calculating what you need to get a 79.5 because I'm rounding that up to an 80. Does that make sense? So these five cells are just placeholders. Those are dummy data. So let's say this student had these grades. That should be their grade in the class. And this would, need, this would be what they need to get to get an A, B, C, or D. Because I know students always ask that. So, so let's just make it simple. So, so if you input your current grades, in Blackboard, this cell should match what the class average is at the very bottom. Okay, make sense? Any questions? I'll send this out later today. Sound good? Unless you want, we can keep going for a few more weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, now, now, now we get the reactions. Okay. All right. I said reactions, and some of you folks in statics are like, no, 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 we're not talking about reactions in here. You don't want me to take a moment and talk about that? No, no, no. no we're fine. <laughs> I, we're very fine. You can just never mention it again. That MATLAB, man, they stay the same. <laughs> Trust me, I can talk about statics. <laughs> I love my job. Okay. Oh, um, I, I'm, I'm starting on lecture 26, but I wanted to finalize what we had done on lecture 25. Um, so let me go back a little bit. This is a good place. Okay, if you recall, during our previous lecture right before break, we were discussing earthwork, and we were discussing how to compute volumes uh, 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 of different uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, segments along a given uh, root-based project. And we had two methods. We either had the end area or the pyramid formula, dependent upon what section you were looking at. Uh, and then we had done this example. Right? We had done this example where we had computed cut and fill volumes for these quantities. Okay? We computed these, these, volumes, uh, for cut, uh, these cut and fill volumes based on these areas. And so we did that example, but then we said, wait a minute, okay, is this really the whole story? And the answer is no, because if you're ever disturbing earth, the, like, a cubic foot of earth in its bank or in situ state is not the same as in its loose state or maybe in its compacted state. So we sometimes need to adjust cut and fill volumes to account for the disturbance that we make whenever we're performing uh, earthwork operations. 
Um, and so uh, we call those uh, um, phenomena from, a, from an earthwork perspective, we call that either shrinkage or swell. So shrinkage happens when we're compacting a material to a density greater than its you know, uh, uh, in, in situ state. Um, and so this can, is done a lot in road work applications. Swell tends to happen whenever you have like a rock type material and you're blasting it or, or um, uh, 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 breaking it up into smaller particles, they end up uh, 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 taking up a bigger volume than its uh, natural state. And so we sometimes modify the cut and fill volumes to account for that, okay? So um, the last thing that we hadn't discussed, and, I, and I'm sorry to bring up statics because this is kind of kind of have a little bit of analogy, but um, uh, one of the things we didn't discuss at the very end was a mass hall diagram. So for example, um, if I have a given project and this is the existing ground and this is the grade line, okay? So the existing ground versus the final grade, some of this is gonna get cut, some of this is gonna get filled. So the idea is the material, see how the material is kind of kind of be like hauled this way? Y'all see that? Well, a mass haul diagram sort of tells you where the material needs to be moved uh, along the project. And um, it is analogous to like a shear and moment diagram. That this might be the shear diagram and this might be the moment diagram. But I promise that's my last mention of engineering 213 in here because that apparently tends to be a sensitive uh, subject. Am I uh, sensing some friction there? Hey, two more weeks. Two more weeks. That's all I know. Uh, sensing some friction. Yeah. That, that joke just <laughs> friction. Static friction, kinetic friction. Okay, all right. Um, so what I want to do is I want to compute the uh, earthwork volume. I want to go back to the volumes in example two, and I want to adjust them a little bit, but I also want to calculate cumulative volumes and show you how a mass hall diagram is produced. It's really, really easy, but I just kind of want to do it for completion sake. So let me go back to this problem, okay? So this is the problem that we did together in class. So I have given you some stations, some cut areas, and some fill areas, and we were able to determine cut volumes and fill volumes. And ultimately what we were doing is using either the average of the areas or BH cubed over three, depending upon what section we were on, and the H or the length was the distance between stations. Does everybody remember this? We did this right before break, okay? Um, I'm gonna show you something. So see these numbers like 0, 1.94, 10.17, da, 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 da. So down here, I've repeated those numbers, okay? So it's, it's the same numbers. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, making anything, um, uh, out, speaking anything out of turn, okay? Now let me go back to the slides. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna recalculate the required fill volumes, assuming that we need to account for 25% of shrinkage of the fill, okay? So in other words, what we're going to need to do is increase the amount of fill by 25% to account for the fact that here's fill in its loose state, but in its compact state, it's gonna be smaller. So we're gonna need more of that fill material to, uh, to fill up the same volume. Does that make sense? So, and the, the ratio is 25%. Uh, and where do we get that? That's just a property of the soil or, or the earth that we're working on uh, for the given project, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, so now I'm here, these are the same, uh, 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 this is the same data from the previous problem. So here's the cut volume, here's the fill volume, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these fill volumes and I'm going to increase them by 25%. And so I just want to make sure we're clear. Everybody know, like, what's the easiest way? Like, how do I increase this by 25%? What do I multiply this by? 1.25. 1.25. So just to make sure we're all uh, awake and have pulses and respiratory patterns, what is that times 1.25? This is why I ask, because even during pre-finals week, or formerly known as dead week, you need to bring your Casio FX-115 ES Plus or similar scientific calculator to class. Come on now. 52.69. 52.69. Do I have a second? All right. So this one right here is 52.69, and I just got that by 1.25. Okay? So we can do the same thing 
for the remaining ones. And, and I, I'm not going to make you do all these because I think at this point it's pretty simple. So this is 13.54. This is 1.03. And this is going to be zero. Okay, so all I'm doing is just where it says fill plus or minus, what I'll do is I'll say plus 25%. Okay, so I'm going to sum this up over here as well. So when I sum this up, I get 67.26. Okay, with me so far? Now, what I'm going to do, here's how I'm going to handle this mathematically. I want to calculate these cumulative volumes, okay? And the way that I'm going to handle that is I'm going to treat cuts as positive, and I'm going to treat fills as negative. We'll deal with our actual fills, this adjusted fills. And, and I guess the reason for that is when you're cutting material from the earth, you have earth that you need to deal with, excess earth, right? So if at the end of the project, you had excess cut, you would have earth you need to do something with. Whereas if at the end of the project you had excess fill, that would be sort of a negative volume. You would need to find fill to, uh, uh, to balance that out. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, the way that we do cumulative volumes is we start out at zero. Okay, we start out at zero, sort of like a moment diagram. You start at zero and you go up and down. Okay, uh, no more moment diagrams. Okay. And what we do is we take our previous value, and what we do is we add the cuts, we subtract the fills. So I'm going to add this cut, subtract this fill. So 0 plus 0 minus 52.69 is negative 52.69, OK? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, that volume, I'm going to add the cut, subtract the fill. And what do we get for that? So do y'all see the pattern? Negative 64.29. Okay. All right. So then what we do is we take that value. We just keep doing it. So we take that value. We add the cut, subtract the fill. And that one's going to be, I'll do that one for you. Negative. 55.14, <clears throat> excuse me, and then lastly, add the cut, subtract the fill. So negative 55.14 plus 53.93 minus zero is what? Somebody help me with that. One. Say it again. Negative 1.22. Do I have a second? Now, is it 22 or 21? I'm getting 21 because it's 4 minus 3. Okay, let me show you something. Everybody watch up here. Let me watch it. Okay, see how this is negative uh, 1.21? What would you get if you took the sum of the cuts minus the sum of the fills? What would you get? Same thing. So you have a check on the problem, okay? And so what we would do is, so what is a mass hall diagram? A mass hall diagram is just a plot of the station and the volume. Station, volume, station, volume, station, volume, station, volume. And so because it's negative, what that essentially means is that along the project, we're going to be moving Earth backwards. We're going to be starting this and moving Earth this way. That's what a negative mass hall diagram is. If it was positive, we'd be pushing Earth forward. Okay? That's kind of what a mass hall diagram means. Okay? Does that make sense? That's really kind of it. That, that, I mean, I, 
I wanted to cover it, but it's really pretty straightforward. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Well, I have one final topic to discuss with you uh, this semester, and that is the topic of construction. Okay. Um, it seems to be a really nice place to end the semester, given the fact that we do happen to be civil engineers and that's kind of what we're all about is building stuff. So let's talk about construction surveying. And I'm mostly going to be presenting a lot of high level ideas. I'm not really going to be getting into the weeds uh, behind this because the, the weeds, as it were, involves all the stuff we've been talking about this entire semester. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and uh, uh, establish the idea behind construction surveying, which is really about establishing line and establishing grade. But then I'm going to be talking about procedures for common applications, like buildings, like pipelines, like roads. And you'll kind of see how everything that we've been doing this entire semester, you can do all of this. At least now, now that you've covered a lot of these, uh, these um, uh, techniques. So surveying uh, is, is really integral to the process of construction. Um, without accurate surveying or accurate measurement of the earth, we really can't do modern construction, period. Okay? Um, whether it's estimating quantities or staking out locations, uh, ensuring that our projects are aligned appropriately, there's really no way to do that without land measurement. And I think I mentioned this at the very beginning of the semester, but I think it probably is starting to ring a lot more true now that we're near the end. You all have had a fair amount of experience in the field, and you know that there was, like, let's just take the innovation building, the new business building. There's no way that building would have gotten constructed accurately without accurate land surveying. Just period, you know, point blank. Um, I would say that at least half, if not more, work, uh, uh, half or more uh, work, uh, from a, a surveyor's perspective related to construction is on location, and it's usually establishing line and grade. Okay, and what do I mean by that? Um, I'm, I'm talking about placing stakes and placing reference lines along a construction site to guide a, a given project. Um, how does that process work? Pretty much the same way your curve lab worked, right? I mean, what did you do in that curve lab? Let's just take a step back. You did some math. You calculated some values, and you ultimately boiled it down to two things, distances and angles, right? You remember at, at the very beginning of the semester, what is surveying? It is the measurement of what two quantities, distances and angles. And then we went out to the field, and we staked them. We placed flags. And by golly gosh, when, when we looked, it was a curve, right? Well, it's the same idea for really any type of project that we do, whether it's buildings, roads, it doesn't matter. It's all the same idea. So what type of tasks, though, if we're starting to hammer down a little bit, what type of tasks do construction surveyors need to do? Well, one of the first things they need to do is establish horizontal and vertical control. Do, do you know what I mean when I say that? What do I mean, what do you think I mean when I say establish horizontal and vertical control? There's a word I'm looking for. It was a word that we used as a reference for our leveling labs. The word is benchmark. Establishing a, a, a point of reference, either horizontally to try and lay out a project or vertically from an elevation perspective, right? That's ultimately what we need. Um, whenever you're going back and doing a survey, so for example, for the innovation building, I guarantee you there are control points out there uh, right now where as the project was ongoing, a land surveyor can go out, set up on a back, or set up backside of control, set the angle to zero, and go to work. Right. So the surveyor needs to set some control to begin the project. Topo, which uh, you know, obviously, uh, I think we could recognize how that's important from an earthwork perspective, before and after. Um, designing in CAD, um, obviously, I think that's going to be important. But a lot of what you're doing in the field is staking. Staking and really restaking uh, also um, uh, uh, of the, the, uh, the design. So physically going out and staking the design um, on the field to either guide equipment or guide uh, construction. Uh, the other thing that you'll need to do 
is periodic monitoring of the construction throughout the project. And I'll give you a very good example of that uh, in terms of roads here in a bit. And then finally, we'll typically do an as-built. So an as-built is just a final record of the difference between what was designed and what was actually constructed. And I think everybody in here would agree now that there are going to be some slight differences. That's just the real world. Okay? Um, let's talk about construction staking. So um, usually the land surveyor um, is either the first person on site or the last person on site each day. Okay? Because what they're going to do, so if they're the last person on site, what they're doing is they're taking stock of what construction was done that day so that the next day they can come in and guide, okay, you place this much fill, you need to place a little bit more. Um, and vice versa if we're talking about uh, 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 being first on site. Um, surveyors will typically place two different types of stakes. They'll place temporary stakes and permanent stakes. Now temporary stakes, so let's talk about a road project. Temporary stakes are going to be along, usually along the center line of the road, right? So think of the curve lab that we did. That curve, imagine that curve represents the center line of the road. We'll place stakes, but they'll be temporary. Why would we, so if we're doing a road project, why would the stakes along the center line of the road be temporary? What do you think? Like, like, if, like if I'm placing stakes to guide construction along the center line, why would those stakes along the center line be temporary? Because they dug and there's a road there. Exactly. They're going to get dug up. That's exactly right. They're going to get dug up, right? The more permanent stakes are placed at an offset. So, for example, we have the center line of the project, and we might place a permanent stake, I don't know, um, offset from the highway, maybe around 10 feet from the corner of the building. So there is a difference between a temporary stake for guiding construction and a permanent stake that we'll use as a, as a more accurate reference later. So again, surveyors are, are going to be doing both. Um, now, when we're talking about uh, the terms establishing line uh, and grade, um, I mean, I can go into a, um, a, a, a technical definition if you want. But really what we're trying to do is ensure that the project has accurate information, both from a plan view and a profile uh, or elevation view consideration. So establishing line, that term basically means defining the plan view, which is the coordinates, the um, horizontal distance, the horizontal orientation uh, along the project. This is very much in line with what you did in the curve lab, right? Because in the curve lab, we were not considering elevation in the slightest, right? I mean, it really didn't matter. We were just angle distance, angle distance, angle distance. So those flags that we were placing for the curve lab were there to establish line. That's what we were trying to do, establish the guidance along the center line of the project. Grade would be basically placing a stake and saying, at this point, you need to cut 5.2 feet. Or at this stake, you need to fill 3.6 feet. Uh, and what have you. That's the difference between establishing line and establishing grade. Now, the way that we do this, again, establishing line, we did this during the curve lab. Right? How do we do that? Point at some reference or backside, set the horizontal angle to zero, turn the instrument to some uh, um, defined angle, and set a stake at the predetermined distance and angle. That's pretty much it. Okay. Now, one thing that I think is maybe a little counterintuitive when you're establishing a line is that it is usually more accurate to cite a distance that is far away. Okay? Here's what I mean by that. Let me give you an example. And I think my folks that held the rod would definitely know what I'm talking about. So you're holding the rod, right? Okay? And you're trying to keep the whole thing level while somebody's citing it. Okay? So let's say the rod is doing this a little bit. You're going to get a lot more error if the person holding the instrument is right here versus if the person holding the instrument is on the other side of Buskirk Field. Because that amount of variability just doesn't mean that much when you're really far away. Does that make sense? So if you want a good accurate line and a good accurate distance, your backside should actually be really far away, not really close together. You, so I know that's a little counterintuitive, but you can, because you're citing it in directly, and especially if you're, you know, dealing with this, you can account for that error. That error gets minimized 
when the back sites are, are, are far away. As for what the actual monument could be or what the back site could be, it could be a lot of things. You can actually like place a stake, place a nail. You could site a given feature uh, uh, you know, in, in the field. I, I know surveyors that will find some you know, sign or some, I don't know, uh, uh, um, a cell phone tower or what have you, and use that point that's really, really far away as a back site. There's, there's really nothing wrong with that as long as it's fixed and as long as you can get uh, accurate control each time. Uh, establishing grade, again, so what we're doing when establishing grade is, so let's say we're using uh, an auto level, right? So the idea is, okay, um, we'll set the instrument up, so do a back site. Remember, elevation plus the back site will give us the height of the instrument. The height of the instrument minus the foresight will give us the elevation here, right? So maybe what you do is you set a stake, you do a foresight, and that will tell us the elevation of that point right there. But I don't really care about the elevation of that point right there. What I care about is what the elevation should be, okay? And what the elevation should be should be a function of all the earthwork calculations that we do. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to that here in a bit. You'll see how that's labeled here in a bit. So what specifically do we stake out? Well, we'll stake out a uh, roadway center line. So usually stakes along the stations, along the curves, PC, PT, uh, what have you. Um, what about highways? Well, we typically, so here's, here's how we do highways. Again, we typically stake out the center line. And again, there's the temporary versus permanent. But the other thing that we will install are what are called slope stakes. So let me show you what a slope stake looks like, okay? So a slope stake would be, let's, it's, I think it's a little easier to maybe look over here on the right. So let's take a look here at this upper feature. So this upper feature, I have a stake here in the center, and this stake here in the center is the center line, and I have a C9.2. That C9.2 means that from the earth, I need to cut 9.2 feet to go from existing ground to where the base is, right? Now that's the cut. What about over here? Well, what the math tells me is if I go here at whatever my slope is supposed to be, that is where the cut ends, right? So I'll place the stake right here, and I'll mark it with this. So what's going on with this mark right here? So I've got C18.6. What is C18.6? Well, it's a cut of 18.6, and where is it? It is 68.4 feet to the right of the station, right? So... If you're looking in plan view, this is the center line of the road, but these slope stakes might go in and out depending upon what the road looks like. So here's a fill station. So for example, here's a cut at the, very, at the center line, but over here, this is what the road is supposed to look like, so there's gonna be a fill station over there. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on that? Just the idea? But again, how do we do that? Well, if you all know how to run an auto level, it's pretty straightforward. We can do the height of the instrument minus the foresight to get the height and just take the height minus what the height should be, and there you go. It's either cut or fill, right? Pretty simple. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that surveyors will not just um, uh, survey a given uh, project at one point. They will continuously resurvey it. Well, a good example of why would be looking at road construction. So road construction, it's specifically asphalt pavements, um, have multiple layers, okay? So the first thing that we'll have is the, uh, what we call the subgrade. The subgrade is just the ground, the existing ground, okay? So a surveyor will come in and monitor, okay, here's what the existing subgrade is. Is, is the base where it should be, or is the, the, not the base, is the subgrade at the elevation it should be, okay? Then we'll place the subbase. The subbase is usually larger gravel, okay? And, and how thick that is and where deep that is uh, is usually dependent upon your, the, the frost level and whatnot. Um, but we place our subbase, and let's say the specification calls for, I don't know, six inches. I'm making that up. Six inches. So six inches, right? So once that's placed, the surveyor will come in and then check, did the, are the elevations right? before we then go in and place the base, right? Then place the base, do it again. Then place the asphalt, right? Because you don't want to place the asphalt and then find your elevations are wrong and have to tear all that up. You know? So you'll continuously monitor that throughout the site. And I'm not even mentioning the fact right now, what if you have a, um, 
a, a cross slope. What if the elevation on one side of the road is different than the other? Like you have some super elevation or something. So then you would need to take uh, rod readings both on this side of the road and on this side of the road. Make sense? Okay. What about pipeline construction? Yes, we have to deal with that as civil engineers. Um, we typically as civil engineers deal with two different types of pipeline constructions, either stormwater pipelines or sanitary sewer pipelines. So stormwater pipelines are dealing with the storm runoff rain uh, uh, from, from storm events. And sanitary sewer pipelines are, well, you can guess what sanitary sewer pipelines are. Those are your sewage, you know. Um, we have to carry both. Um, what we will typically do is we will, uh, uh, when we're installing these, we will open an excavation along the alignment. Um, and then what we're trying to do is excavate to a prescribed depth and then maybe a little bit more if we want to have some uh, bedding and whatnot under the pipe. Uh, and then install the pipe backfill it uh, and compact it. So one of the things we have to worry about, uh, not just from a station to station, but along the project is are the elevations correct? So what we'll typically do is we'll say, okay, we'll install one of these uh, right here. This is what's called a batter board. A batter board is basically just two uh, uh, pieces of wood and a piece of wood uh, alongside it that's level. So like a two by four here and here, maybe like a one by six there. Uh, and so what we'll do is We'll install these, you know, along stations for alignment. We'll usually have like a little nail sticking around here in case we want to tie a string line from, from uh, station to station. And we usually do that around uh, every 50 feet or so. I say around every 50 feet because if you've got change in direction or, or change in pipe size and whatnot, you might do that uh, a, a little bit, a little bit, space a little bit differently. Uh, and, but again, it's the same idea. It's the difference between what the elevation is and what the elevation should be. And what we're really focused on is this elevation right there. And we call that the invert elevation. The invert elevation is the bottom of the flow, the bottom of where the, the water or whatever would be flowing. Okay, Does that make sense? Now, again, not only do we need to worry about this from a station to station perspective, but we need to worry about this along the project. Most pipelines that we will install, if it's not a like high pressure water line, like a hydraulic consideration, if we're talking about storm water or we're talking about sanitary sewer, we typically have those uh, uh, drain as a function of gravity. So the line is not flat, it is actually sloped downward, okay? So typical slopes are around a minimum of a half a percent, maybe one or two, dependent upon uh, the needs. Um, and not only do we need to install the pipe, but we also need to consider manholes, right? So just so everybody's aware, whenever you install a manhole, you're usually doing it for a reason. And usually the reason is whenever there's a change in slope, uh, a change in diameter, uh, maybe a change in direction for the flow, that's when you're installing a manhole because that's where problems arise. Problems typically don't arise when everything's you know, uh, prismatic and copacetic, it's when you have a disturbance. That's why you install the manhole there so, so that it's accessible. And again, whether you're looking at it from a cross-section perspective or a profile view perspective, what you're trying to ensure is that constant uh, invert elevation, okay? But again, how do we do this? It's just auto levels, back sites and fore sites. No different, no different, okay? What about building construction? Let's talk about building construction. Okay, so let's let's first talk about like the 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 process. Um, the first thing that you need to consider is um, not just where the building is, but also maybe where the building can be. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. Um, so let's say I have a, a given piece of property, and a good example of that would be like a piece of property inside the city of Huntington, okay? So let's say that here's a piece of property and here's the street, okay? Um, keep in mind, there's another piece of property right here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build my house right there. That seems kind of mean, doesn't it? Like, would, d does that seem like a good idea? No, right? Typically, um, you will want to offset or to set, the term is setback, 
set back that property from the property line, okay? You can find what are called, how many of you have heard of zoning ordinances? Or zoning, right? So zoning ordinances will typically, what they're there to do is to give you the rules on where you can place, you know, uh, uh, given, you know, uh, features and so on and so forth uh, within a given tract of land. And so they typically get more restrictive the more populous an area is. So if you're living like out in the country, they're, zoning ordinances are gonna be incredibly minimal or non-existent, right? But if you're in the middle of a major city, there's gonna be very specific rules on where you can place a, a given dwelling and what have you. So maybe one of the first things you need to do is develop some setback uh, 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 guidance. So the setback might be from the property line, the zoning ordinance might say, okay, you've got a side yard setback, a front yard setback, and a rear yard setback. So you as the surveyor will place some stakes and you'll say, okay, the house can be inside that area. That's where you can put the house, okay? So you go, you design some stuff, you figure out where the building's gonna be, and then it's time to actually stake it out, okay? Now, how do we stake it out? Set up here. Backside, distance angle, distance angle, distance angle, distance angle. And then, so set up here, backside, turn an angle, shoot a distance, turn an angle, shoot a distance, turn an angle, shoot a distance. And we place our stakes for the proposed building, right? Now, those stakes are gonna be very temporary, okay? What we're actually going to need to do is use some batter boards. Why? The same reason for the roads. We're gonna dig this up. Right, I mean, we're going to dig this up. We're going to place a foundation, right? So we'll place a temporary stake for the corner, but then what we'll do is we'll come off to the side and place these batter boards. And typically what we'll do is we'll go a few feet off on either end and tie some string. And the idea is that where the strings intersect, you hang a plumb bob, that hangs right over the point, okay? So that those can serve as guidance as you're uh, 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 setting your foundation, as you're you know, uh, uh, erecting your CMU walls and so on and so forth. And so if you had a building that was a little bit more involved, right, you would end up probably needing a few more batter boards, but the idea is the same, right? You would just tie, uh, uh, tie that string so to where those intersection points hover over a given um, property corner and then go to work. But everything that I'm talking about is just angles and distances, okay? There's nothing here, and notice how I'm not going into the details about, like for example, I'm not going into the details about how you would do this, because we've already done this, right? Set up here, do a resection in order to determine a uh, location and orientation. Do a backside, set the angle to zero, angles and distances. We've been doing this this whole semester, right? So I just wanted you to sort of see how the tools that we've been developing and the techniques that we've been learning can be used for a wide variety of applications uh, in civil engineering, which is why this course is, is required. That's really the whole point, okay? Um, does anybody have any questions? All right, a couple items on logistics. So don't forget, homework nine is due when? Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday at 1 p.m., all right? What are we doing Wednesday? Exam review. So come prepared for questions, okay? So come prepared with questions uh, to, to ask about the exam. Whether it's homework, whether it's topics you didn't understand, what have you, but come prepared. Lab this week is plan reading two, okay? And when is our exam? Friday at 1245 p.m. A.M. A.M. 1245 p.m. in here. What's the one assignment that you need to do that I didn't mention just now? The bonus homework, right? Do the uh, court's eval. Again, I, you be as honest as you want. One thing I'll mention, I want everybody to pay attention to this. All right, one thing I'll mention. The only thing that I can see is how many people have done it. I don't know who did what, right? So if you, so there have been situations where I've, I've been at this point, and I can see that 20 people have done it, and only 18 people have uploaded proof. And so I don't know who did what. And so those are free points. You know, it's free real estate. Those are free points that you're not acquiring. So if you upload that screen capture, you'll get free points. Hold on. Yes, sir. Is there an upload thing for it? It's on Blackboard. Uh, yeah, please 
Yeah, I've gotten a couple emails, and, I, and uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'll remember it, but when in doubt, upload it to Blackboard. Yeah. Is, is there a place for it? Yeah, there, uh, yeah there, there's a no, I was on there this morning, they went to one on there. I, it just opened. Oh, okay. Yeah, if it hasn't opened yet, it'll open at 2 o'clock. Okay. But uh, yeah, all, not, here, here's one other thing I did. Not only is there an upload place there, but on Blackboard, there's actually a direct link to the survey. So you can click the link, and there, so the way it works, there's two links, one for the folks in the Wednesday lab, one for the folks in the Thursday lab, because you're technically in two different classes. So click that, do the survey, upload the proof that you did it. I don't want to see what you did. I just want to see that you did it. So I'll pull up, yeah, hold on, yes? When did it do? So the survey itself closes on Friday, but I have the link open up until next Friday. But... Like, I, I would, you know, get it done, so. All right, I'm going to pull up the code one more time. I will see you all on Wednesday, so.